Well, thank you, Lee. Thank you very much for that introduction, and, and it's a pleasure for me to be here again. Can I acknowledge um, all of those people who've made contributions to this conference till now, and I hope that you've found the deliberations and the information provided uh, of great interest and in helping to set the scene for another uh, successful year for the agricultural sector. Can I also extend my congratulations to ABARES? Uh, July this year marks the 70th anniversary of its service to the nation. 70 years making a contribution to research and education, uh, 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 assistance with forecasting and guidance to the agricultural sector. Uh, all of those things have meant that ABARES has played a very important role in the success of agriculture in this country. And of course, the Outlook Conference itself has been going for a long time. I think the first Outlook Conference that I attended was about 1974. And there's been, uh, I, was, I attended that one as a young farmer and I've been many times since. And I appreciate therefore very much the, the, the pivotal role that this event occurs and, and takes in the uh, year's cycle of the agricultural industries. Much has changed in Australia over seven decades, mm -hmm. but thriving and profitable agriculture and natural resource uh, industries remain fundamental to our national prosperity and, and always will. The mining and resource sector has been a major driver of our economy over the last couple of decades. But with declining in, in the mineral prices, uh, we've come to appreciate again just how important agriculture is to our nation. So often, the contribution of the farm sector is, uh, to our economy is lost on what is an increasingly urbanised nation. And it is therefore important that we take available opportunities to emphasise again and again how important agriculture is to, to achieving and maintaining a prosperous nation. Now, the coalition government has recognised the fundamental value of these essential industries, our resources and our agriculture sector. In spite of commodity price falls, the value of export earnings from Australia's mining and energy, sec energy sector is projected to rise by 7% annually to $274 billion in 2018-19. We therefore understand the need to remove unnecessary breaks on the sector's growth, including wrong-headed taxes. The mining tax was described by the Sydney Morning Herald as one of the history's most idiotic pieces of legislation, which I suppose is something of an achievement, but now it's gone. The removal of the carbon tax saves industry compliance costs estimated $85 million per annum and yields average annual savings of $550 for every household in Australia. We come into office determined to create a better platform for Australian business, to operate and, and, to, and to grow the nation's wealth. The removal of these two confused and counterproductive taxes were a major plank in our platform. This achievement is often, often overlooked by the mainstream media. There was an expectation that they would be abolished simply and very quickly. But as you know, we had to fight to get rid of them. And I know that industries appreciate the fact that they're gone. We promised also to reduce red and green tape for business by $1 billion a year. Well, that target was exceeded last year and will do even better this year. We've unlocked the logjam of Commonwealth environmental uh, laws, releasing something over $800 million billion worth of projects to be able to come to fruition. We've got the NBN back on track and starting to connect Australian households, particularly in regional communities where there are around about a thousand broadband wireless towers under construction or planned at the present time. And our $100 million mobile phone black spots program will sort, shortly be announcing uh, su successful black spots to be eliminated. 
we've taken a balanced approach to the nation's fisheries and forestry and resources sector, which balances the need to preserve these assets into the future with the immediate livelihoods of the people and businesses operating in them. Outlook 2015 focuses on the profitability of agriculture, and it's valuable and timely to do so. It reflects the Australian Government's priorities too, freeing up farmers to focus on running their farms, rather than being bogged down in red tape and unnecessary compliance that costs them time and money. For most farmers, their work is about much more than earning a living. It's also about responsible stewardship of the land and natural resources, preserving them for the next generation of farmers. 94% of Australian farmers are actively undertaking natural resource management. It makes economic sense to ensure the sustainability of our land. Anyone who operates a farm can attest that achieving a profit on the land can be more than difficult. It's hard work. If Australian agriculture is not profitable, then the whole nation has a serious problem. As you would have heard yesterday from Minister Joyce, the Australian Government has prioritised agriculture as one of the five pillars of the economy, along with manufacturing innovation, advanced services, education and research, and of course, mining. We have initiated the Agricultural Competitiveness White Paper to identify ways to strengthen the agricultural sector for the challenges it faces into the future. There will always be diverse opinions about the future directions of the agricultural sector, and I think that's a positive thing. But there is little disagreement about the need for agriculture to be profitable. A few years ago, the ecologist and farmer Alan Savory observed that without agriculture, it's not possible to have a city, stock market, banks, university, church or army. Everyone has a stake in profitable agriculture. Achieving it requires efforts from many quarters, including from within my own responsibilities as Minister for Transport, Infrastructure and Regional Development. Infrastructure plays an integral role in contributing to Australia's economic growth and productivity. Nowhere is this more obvious than the case of agriculture, where transport costs comprise a sizeable portion of farm gate value. Profitable agriculture depends on strengthening the social and economic fabrics of our regions. The places where the business end of Australia's $40 billion a year farm exports start. It's also where 12% of Australia's GDP originates. That's about $155 billion a year in economic activity derived from our farms. Efficient and competitive transport infrastructure that connects regional Australia's farmers with their national and international markets is absolutely vital. The benefits of the Asian century are already real, but meeting burgeoning demand for our high quality produce across our global region will only come to fruition if our road, rail and port networks can cope with massively increasing volumes. The government's infrastructure investments mesh with our other efforts to make the most of these opportunities, including the free trade agreements we have formed with Japan, Korea and China, and are progressing with India and the Gulf Cooperation Council. Our food exports accounted for a substantial 15% share of Australia's total merchandise exports, up from 12% in 2011-12. We have taken the live export trade from its lowest ebb. We have reopened trade with Indonesia, revived markets in Egypt and Bahrain, while creating new markets in Cambodia, Thailand, Lebanon and Iran. And we're still working to crack the Chinese market. Since coming into government, the Coalition has worked to strengthen the connections between farmers and their markets with real and strategic commitments. Our record $50 billion investment in critical infrastructure is needed to secure Australia's future prosperity. 
This includes our $5 billion asset recycling initiative, which is designed to stimulate the development of new infrastructure. We are projected to leverage an additional investment of $125 billion off the back of our $50 billion outlay. We're investing in transformational infrastructure projects, which sensibly and necessarily mesh metropolitan and regional needs. Now, you've heard a lot about the large-scale investments in all of our major capital cities, but I'm also proud of our regional investments. $6.7 billion to fix the Bruce Highway to make it safer and more reliable. $5.6 billion to finally complete the duplication of the Pacific Highway from Hexham to the Queensland border within this decade. We've allocated $400 million to upgrade Tasmania's Midland Highway as a key step to growing that state's economy. There's $263 million for Victoria's Western Highway and $185 million for the state's Prince's Highway. We're investing $755 million in the Northlink WA project. This involves new highway and interchange construction and upgrades to existing roads. This work, work will invigorate the key freight route connecting Perth to the north of Western Australia, including the vital transport of equipment and supplies to mining operations in the Pilbara. And there's $335 million for the Great Northern Highway, $174 million for the North West Coastal Highway, also in Western Australia. We are committed to $1.3 billion for the Toowoomba Second Range Crossing and $508 million to upgrade the Warrego Highway. $290 million is being announced this week to upgrade other sections of the National Highway Network, some of which are not always in the news. We are investing $2.1 billion to extend Roads to Recovery, the popular local roads and streets program and we're paying the latest investment of $117 million to 297 local governments today. And these are just some of the highlights of an infrastructure investment portfolio firmly focused on the needs of Australia's agriculture and resource industry engine rooms. There's another 210 million upgrade infrastructure for the Cape York Peninsula roads. Across the country, we are allocating 500 million to fix the black spots on roads. In last week, uh, we announced 86 projects under round one of the new $300 million bridges renewal program, mostly in rural communities. We're repairing and dilapidating old bridges, including many that cannot carry heavy vehicles anymore, to reconnect the heavy transport network. We recognise that the last mile is just as important in bringing produce from the farm or to the farm as the highways are connected to the ports. Yesterday, I announced the rollout of the Australian Government's Heavy Vehicle Safety and Productivity Program, totalling $195 million for 53 projects to improve road safety and economic productivity of the road network. These, to, these initiatives dovetail and will help improve bridges serving local communities and facilitate access for larger, higher productivity vehicles like B-doubles and B-triples. Like never before, our, in, our infrastructure arteries will better integrate Australia's regions into the economic pulse of the nation. The need to boost our international competitiveness in agriculture and resource industries is amongst the most urgent of Australia's needs for a modern 21st century infrastructure. Looking north, the development of Northern Australia is a priority for our government. A growing Northern economy benefits all of us through investment, infrastructure, jobs, services and emerging industries and export potential. The government's white paper on developing Northern Australia is being informed and guided by public submissions and hearings through the Joint Select Committee chaired by Warren Inch. There's real people involved with a real stake in the future of the North. I've long believed that Australia has a unique opportunity to make the, the most of the vast productive expanse that is the North of our nation. It's virtually untapped 
and it's on Asia's doorstep. The agriculture, energy, tourism and recreational prospects of the North are almost limitless. And our government is committed to ensuring we allow these prospects to take root and grow for future generations to enjoy. And we're prepared to back our confidence in the North with real investment. The White Paper is being finalised as I speak and the government looks forward to working with the residents of the North to invest with them in their future. At last year's Outlook conference, I spoke of the government's commitment to the Inland Rail project, a major project which will significantly increase national productivity. It will advantage consumers with lower transport costs, which will be reflected at the checkout, while also supporting economic development along the rail corridor. It will be transformational for agriculture, resources and other regional industries. This is a complex project that will take at least a decade to deliver across three states and requires careful planning. To assist in managing these complexities, I formed an inland rail implementation group led by John Anderson, Australia's longest serving transport minister and a true champion of rail reform. The group has conducted extensive public consultation processes, including stakeholder forums numerous regional community leadership meetings and industry briefings. These consultations have enabled the impl implementation group to advance the project's design specifications. This includes future-proofing the alignment to cater for trains of up to 3,600 metres in the longer term and meeting the needs of industry for services that are competitive with road. The implementation group is also considering how the initial $300 million budgeted by our government for the Inland Rail project can be used most effectively, identifying the early projects to be undertaken in the development of this route. I expect to receive the implementations group advice and the detailed business case for Inland Rail in the middle of this year. This will allow the government to make informed and strategic decisions about the project. The Coalition is committed to accelerating the development of strong and healthy regions. We launched the dedicated $1 billion National Stronger Regions Fund to help deliver the priority projects which create jobs and support regional Australia's economic growth. The fund will help provide the infrastructure that regional communities need, but too often lack. The fund has an annual allocation of $200 million over the five years from July 2015, and applications for round one opened last October. More than 400 applications were received for this round. 11 of those projects were agriculture related, and I'd like to see more applications involving the agricultural sector in round two, which opens on the 1st of May. So to sum up, it's crystal clear that the profitability of our agriculture and resource industries is far from just an industry specific issue. It has flow on effects to the whole nation. So much of the ec economic activity is driven from the regions and felt across the nation, in every city and in every home. A strong, profitable future for agriculture, resources and regional communities it is inextricably linked to the prosperity of Australia and all Australians. Our international trading balance sheet also depends on it. This places a great responsibility on everyone involved in farming today to ensure that we have the industries that will continue to flourish for generations to come and in doing so feed and sustain those generations. Today, I hope I've given you a sense of our government's commitment to your industry and your livelihoods, and a sense of a deep commitment to ensure that regional Australia is able to play its share in building a more prosperous nation. Thank you.